Greetings, uh, friends who are with us today, um, and welcome to Live at 345, which is an extension of the podcast, A Church Dismantled, The Kingdom Restored, uh, which looks at a variety of issues that God is up to in the world, in the church, your life, my life. And uh, the Live at 345 is a way of digging deeper and diving deeper into some of those issues and seeing where God is at work. And today I'm delighted to have as our guest, Linda Crockett. I think I met Linda about a decade ago um, as I was pastoring, still pastoring that congregation, Linda. And you were so helpful and have been helpful over the last decade at a variety of times in our situation, in our congregation. And you also, we were one of the part, of, we were one of the early parts, uh, members of the cohorts uh, that you did uh, earlier in safe church work. And so just welcome, it's so good to have you here. Um, I just think the work you're doing is so much kingdom work. It's the kind of work that Jesus was so interested in doing and bringing safety and life and uh, security and shelter to the most vulnerable. So thank you for joining us. And it's really yours to introduce yourself and take this where you'd like to go today. Yeah, thank you so much, Conrad. It's a real privilege to be here with everybody today. Um, I am so taken by the idea of dismantling and also then building something new, because that's been a theme for me both personally and professionally in so many ways. I come to the work on child sexual abuse prevention and helping men and women who have survived it to heal through my own experiences as a survivor of sexual and physical abuse as a child, and believing that God never willed for that to happen to me or to any other child. But I think there's a purpose that was mine in that my life's call then has been to do what I can to make sure that other children are protected and that survivors have opportunities not just to recover, but to really heal and live with joy and abundance. So that's what I would say my call has been. And of course, that kind of call often involves a lot of dismantling and then rebuilding. So I am director of an organization called Safe Communities. We're based in Lancaster. We evolved from programs that ran under Samaritan Counseling Center for many years that were primarily known as Safe Church and then some other smaller programs where we would work deeply with congregations to help them build policies and practices and educate people about how to protect children from sexual harm. Not just in the church building itself, but out there in the community where we live, where parents, where grandmothers, where aunts, where uncles, there are children out there we love. And so although Safe Communities was established as a new organization in 2019, the work that I do and that we do goes back for uh, a long time before we established safe communities. In fact, I had a dismantling a bit when I left my first career in the corporate world, working with finances and banks to follow a call to El Salvador to work with refugees in that war-torn country. I worked with a lot of MCC folks and um, really began to process and remember some of my own sexual trauma as I was walking with so many women who had experienced that as an act of war. And so I ended up leaving that corporate career and coming into the nonprofit world at Samaritan, hmm, 2003, so many years ago. And that was a kind of dismantling because I made a whole lot more money <laughs> in the corporate world and I had all kinds of benefits. I didn't have that when I came into nonprofit that I thought, this is what I'm being called to do. I need to follow this lead. And so 
At Samaritan, I worked with many programs, most of them focused on how do we protect people from sexual abuse, some on violence between partners, which also happens in our congregation, what we call domestic violence. And I did the work for a lot of years there. But then gradually, I think, like many of our churches today, and many of our traditionally structured nonprofits, after the founder, who was a pastor himself and a very visionary man, Jim Hanna, left retirement, finally, well-deserved a number of years back, things slowly began to change. And it was interesting because I was working with churches that were going also through this kind of change where there was a sense that as, as we grew and as we adopted to more of a business kind of model for churches and for nonprofit, there's a gradual shift to finances and maintaining the institutional structure. And I think that comes at a heavy price. Um, I know it's a part of growth for churches and nonprofits, but you can begin to feel like it's more about maintaining an institution because you're no longer able to be available to listen to that call. Where are we being led? I always have to figure it out on a spreadsheet first. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so anyhow, by the um, end of 2019, um, we decided it was time to part ways with Samaritan, and they gave us, you know, their blessing, you know, to do that. And so we formed safe communities. You know, I came from Samaritan. I think at that time they had a $2 million budget almost, came here with like just a little bit of money <laughs> and, you know, faith in God and a really dedicated team. And um, I would say we still live many times month to month rather than in a, a place of we're sustaining ourselves for the next five years. We try to get grants and find donors, but I think the important thing that I would say about that dismantling and the one I went through before in corporate world is that when you are freed from having to maintain an institution that relies heavily on financial security as kind of its main focus, you become liberated in a way to do God's work. And there's a freedom with that. So at Safe Communities, we are branching out in many ways. Beyond churches, we're working with organizations, working with parents groups, doing lots of workshops for kids and teens themselves. Um, and we're building a kind of nonprofit that's multiracial, that's equity centered, and that really is mission driven. So we want to be a very different kind of nonprofit. And um, so in our few short years as safe communities, we've reached a lot of people, despite having very little money to do it with. And we have um, really been blessed and flourished as we've grown our work. And we think that one of the interesting things, a change that we are seeing from churches that we worked with, say, eight, 10 years ago, through the Safe Church program is in a lot of churches today, and really since Pennsylvania changed all its mandatory reporting laws, there becomes a hyper focus on the legality of everything, getting your background checks, getting your clearances, sending your staff or volunteers to a two hour online training where they click through boxes, right? Instead of investing in the work of, how do we really build awareness in this congregation? So parents are educated. So teachers understand how to be safe people for children to raise this topic, to disclose to. So we do see some growing kind of resistance to anything but 
the basics in a lot of congregations, which is heartbreaking because we know very well they're just getting background checks and complying with mandatory reporting, which is an after the fact kind of thing, doesn't do nearly enough or actually just a small way forward to protecting children from sexual harm. So there's so much more to abuse prevention than that. You know, it's learning um, how to safely integrate known sexual offenders, you know, and we've increased our work around that a lot in congregations because many of them are very well intentioned. They want to include everyone in fellowships and inclusivity is great, but it's also something that needs to be done very wisely and carefully. And with a lot of really good boundary keeping and a lot of good training for people who will supervise that particular offender while he or she is on site. So we're also doing some of that kind of work with churches and I'm glad that more of them are taking a kind of stance that we want to make sure that we prioritize safety as we do this. So that's been a lot of our, a lot of our work. Of course, um, we've also developed much more work around how do we create safe congregations for the many adult survivors of child sexual and even adult sexual violence who are in our congregations. As we grew our work with Safe Church, which was mostly focused on protecting children, we began to hear some critique from men and women who were in the pews as survivors. And we always offered like a retreat for churches. They said, this is not enough, you know? Just as a congregation has to change its practices and culture to be safe for children, they also need to do that for us. So we began to develop what we now call a survivor-centered curriculum for churches that is really teaching congregations, and we work with a lot of Mennonite and Brethren, but also other denominations as well. How do you create an environment where the men and women among you who have been sexually violated feel safe and welcome? And so one of our newest pieces of work has been developing uh, what we call a congregational guide so I don't know of anything else like it, because we thought surely there's got to be something out there we can reference. But we um, had some funding from Lancaster Mennonite Conference, the foundation they have to do this guide. And so we produced a guide to how do you create a safe environment for survivors of sexual abuse in your congregation. And Anybody can access it directly from our website, which is www.safecommunitiespa.org. And I co-created it with a male survivor who is a pastor. So he and I wrote the guide together. And we talk about the impact of child sexual abuse on faith. We have sections in the guide for when you're in a congregation, how do you talk about this to other people? Once you raise this issue in a congregation, congregants can get very emotional and they can say things that inadvertently may really offend or hurt a survivor, but they don't know that person's a survivor. So we need to be sure we know how to talk about this issue without doing more harm. So it's giving congregants some language to talk to each other about how we speak about this issue. And we have focus on how do we respect survivor stories if someone does choose to share part of their story with us as just an ordinary person in the congregation, what do I do? How do I respond to that? 
And then another part is understanding what a trigger is, what can be triggering, what can reactivate trauma for a survivor. So this is something intended, the first section of the guide for the whole congregation to normalize this conversation because it takes more than trained leaders to do this. It takes a congregation that's engaged in it. And then we do um, elements of a safe environment, a safe church, what does that look like? So people kind of have a checklist. And then one of the things that I really like, I think I got muted for a second there, yeah. There. 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 So yeah, one of the parts of the guide that I really like that the pastor, Mark Harris, who co-wrote it with me, contributed is what we call Sturm and Seeds. Because you know a lot of pastors have a hard time preaching sermons around this topic. Mm -hmm. So let's give them a few ideas for starters. Let's give them some text and a one pager on how you might approach this biblical story mm -hmm. through the lens. So we have guide for pastors as well as congregations. So that's a big part of our work lately. Also focusing on these many adult men and women who are wounded in our congregations and certainly the Me Too movement a number of years back was quickly followed by Church Too. As many survivors of abuse within churches, not necessarily by pastors, some by pastors, but many other by people in the congregation. And it was never addressed or when it was found out it was poorly addressed, took to social media. And so churches are not safe places for survivors. So that's been an impetus as well. And in fact, I would say that as we grow the groups and retreats and the number of survivors that come to us for the kind of healing space we create, we're not doing clinical therapy. We're doing something far different, which is we're creating small communities of healing and support for these survivors. They are trauma-informed. They are psychoeducational in nature, but they're not clinical treatment. They're not individual, but they happen in small groups and people hunger for that. Individual counseling is a good thing and sometimes it's needed, but we find it often doesn't connect survivors back to the community. It stays very privatized. And when they can come into small groups that are carefully facilitated by someone who is trauma trained to hold the space and guide the discussion, they are very powerful healers of each other. As long as you have somebody to hold the framework and make sure it stays safe because traumatized people can also do harm to each other when things get very emotional. And so I am starting to term what we're seeing now as so many survivors who are what I call refugees from the church. They are leaving churches and have been for a number of years. They don't feel they're responsive. They don't feel they're safe. We have heartbreaking stories from them all of the time. But the interesting thing and perhaps the hopeful, hopeful thing is that Although they feel like they have lost a church, they have, most of them have not lost faith in God or spirit. They want to heal with that and they can't find it in their churches. And so our churches by and large have not done a good job of becoming safe places for survivors. And they're starting to do kind of not such a good job if they continue to focus hard on just being legally co compliant with mandatory reporting and think that that's enough to keep kids safe. And so I think, you know, a lot of these survivors say to us that the groups to them feels like holy space, feels like sacred space, safe space. And sometimes you'll hear them say, why can't it be like this in our church? Why can't it be? 
And I don't have a good answer to that. I don't have a good answer. I, I know I get contacted from scholars and people in the field. I had a woman from Princeton that I was in conversation with a couple of months ago, and she heard about the work we do with church, and she's, you know, writing, she's writing some papers and, you know, wanted to, to interview me and find out more about the work, particularly with survivors as she writes her thesis or dissertation. And, you know, I described the work we were doing in churches and the history and what we were seeing. And it was one of those conversations where you feel immediately connected, you know, with another person. And we went pretty deep, pretty fast. And at one point, she said to me, do you think the institutional church is capable of turning itself around so it actually does become a safe place for survivors? Or are you just trying to do what you can while it's being kind of dismantled? And I just stopped for a moment. I said, honestly, I'm not sure it is capable of it. I said, I'm not sure. I said, I don't know what will happen with, when I say the church, I mean, not any particular denomination, the church at large. I said, I don't know if the institution itself and the congregations within it can ever truly invest the time and resource that's needed to become safe for survivors. But in, until the time happens when that structure is no longer with us, and my work is to do what I can within that structure to try to make them safer, because there are many vulnerable survivors and children still there, and to also offer a space for survivors who feel like they've lost their church, that they haven't lost their faith. So we find ourselves in this strange kind of space of you know, working Linda, hard to get churches to change and also knowing we're not sure. If I could just a minute, you know, the people you're describing are in so many ways, it feels like the people who've connected with the work I'm doing in this podcast. I often say I'm I'm speaking to the diaspora. I'm speaking to those who have left the church or on the margins of the church, haven't given up on Jesus, haven't given up on God, but have not found the church this kind of space that you described. And I, you know, we face it in terms of racism as well. And I said, I think it's only in a dismantled church that we'll ever dismantle racism. And I, I wonder as I listen to you, if it's not only in a dismantled church that we also really dismantle take the mantle off of these things that um, of these of, uh, of, of these things that get in the way of our being truthful and transparent and, and caring for one another. And so I'm just struck by the similarities of these populations that I think we're both touching. And I too am doing this work outside of the church. I do it, the college has embraced it, but I'm not, I'm really doing it on my own because there's so much, there's so much baggage around trying to do this kind of work mm -hmm. under the umbrella of informal institutions. Exactly, and as we grew programmatically to be a stronger advocate and more determined about racial justice to be integrated into this work and more determined to be outspoken about the need to change, you know, we become more of an uneasy fit for a religious counseling center, just like you become an uneasy fit for a church, you know, and you hear people, in churches say, you know, things that are really hurtful, like, oh, God never gives you more than you can handle. Mm -hmm. You know, that is said to survivors. Mm -hmm. And I will never offer any survivor that kind of platitude. Yeah. Because so many of these children who are violated become adults yeah. with a host of physical and emotional problems facing addictions and homelessness and poverty, sex trafficking, suicide. You know, sexual abuse is more than a lot of people can handle. Yeah. It can destroy a person emotionally and physically, and it can destroy their faith in a loving, redemptive God. Yeah. yeah. You know? So, and that is, brings me to maybe the final thing I'll share with you is that the past two years, we have seen in a tremendous increase in our work with the Amish and Old Order Mennonite communities. It is like 
I never imagined we would have so many women, especially in Amish communities, wanting to share their stories and calling for change. And so I worked with um, a number of um, Amish, we've always worked with some Amish women, but it's never been a big focus of our work. So I helped a investigative journalist who is really good and wanted to tell the stories of some of these women, um, meet with some Amish ladies that I knew and I trusted this journalist and she told their stories in a really pretty amazing and sensitive way in a series of national magazine articles. And because I was part of that, we began getting more and more contact from women, especially in the Amish community who were saying, you know, not only were they sexually abused as children, they're experiencing violence from their husbands, their ministries and bishops are putting barriers up to reporting, as well as for them to get the kind of counseling that they need. And so along with Judge Dennis Reinecker, who's one of the Lancaster County judges who happens to just catch a lot of sexual abuse cases. It seems to be a lot. He and I formed a Lancaster County Task Force earlier, I guess it was in early 2020, to begin to address this in the community. And we have a, a few different nonprofit organizations and then some People who come from conservative Mennonite traditions, but are not horse and buggy Amish in the past force. And over the past year, I have been meeting in the homes of Amish people at the invitation, usually, of a woman who's heard about us. There are some men who are supporting their efforts for change. But it's going to be really complicated because a lot of the male ministry leaders and the bishops and the ministries will punish people who go outside to get help, you know, and the punishment includes, you know, for one woman I've recently been supporting, um, you know, she had a, a husband that was very abusive towards her and also sexually abusive towards his children. And so we encouraged her to get it reported and a, an Amish man who was in her church actually helped her. He was very brave, he stepped out. So she got a protection from abuse order, which is, you know, that's pretty big step for an Amish woman. But now what's happening is she is being punished until she withdraws that order, she's not allowed to have communion. Her daughters can't have communion. She has to accept being counseled by a group from the ministry. She can't go to an outside counselor. So there's a lot of, I mean, every community has sexual abuse. Every community has this problem. The Amish are not unique, but the barriers they have for reporting and actually getting help, those are unique. So we're gonna to continue to do a lot of that work. It has been a delight to have you with us, Linda. This is, uh, it's, it's such meaningful work. It's such work of the kingdom, but it's also hard work. And um, you only alone know how difficult that is. So thank you for, for doing that work on behalf of so many and um, for being with us today and for sharing this. And I would love to get a hold of that guide. I wasn't even aware of that guide. Absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. Go to our website. It looks like this. And you'll see a pretty picture of it okay. and just click download and you've got it and you can share it, you can print it, you can do whatever you like. But just go to www.safecommunitiespa.org and scroll down and you'll see it. We and try we'll to make it pretty and big so people okay. can find it. <laughs> and we'll put the website on uh, any information that we use as we put this out as a YouTube and on Facebook and a podcast. Perfect. So thank you so much, Conrad, for yeah. welcoming me here and for your work on, you know, kind of recognizing the dismantling and being part of the rebuilding or the building yeah. of something new yeah. as the spirit leads us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank and thank you. you, audience, for being with us and uh, blessings and God's peace. Okay. Bye.